You might know about the show Secret Level, but did you know that one of the episodes was created entirely in Unreal Engine? That's why today we are looking at how Blur Studio was able to use Unreal Engine to bring this episode to life. Welcome to Virtual Production Insider. I'm your host, David Stapp, and it's time for another entry in our Virtual Production Breakdown series where we look at movies and TV shows that use virtual production to bring their ideas to life. Today's episode is all about Secret Level, but more specifically, it's all about the Unreal Tournament episode. This episode was a partnership between Amazon, Epic Games, and Blur Studio, and Blur was nice enough to actually sit down and talk with me about their experience of making this episode. I got to chat with Jean-Baptiste Combier, who is a CG supervisor at Blur Studio, as as well as Vladimir Somov, who is a 3D generalist who specializes in real-time cinematics. So today's episode will be a little different. I'm going to splice in bits and pieces of the interview I did with them, as well as some of my own commentary as we dive deeper into some of the topics we discuss. Now, if you're not familiar with Blur Studio, they are one of the premier 3D animation companies out there. If you've seen a game cinematic in the last decade, there is a very good chance that Blur created it or at least had a hand in it. So let's not waste any more time and let's just get straight into it. And one of the cool things I learned when I started talking with JB and Vlad was that this was one of Blur Studio's first projects they'd ever done in Unreal. Most of us, the vast majority of us, have ne had never used Unreal Engine before. So when, when I started, I thought I could only put a few polygons on screen before even the, the machine wouldn't take it. So imagine my surprise when we kept feeding, we kept building complex pieces and environments and realize, yeah, the engine can take it. It's, it's quite amazing. And if that wasn't enough, they didn't just do the bare minimum to use Unreal Engine. No, they used pretty much every bell and whistle that Unreal Engine comes with for this episode. For example, they really embraced blueprints as opposed to coding everything from scratch, and they were able to create custom blueprints for lighting and characters. Robots, their colors and their numbers were also driven for blueprint, so it was really easy on the fly to fix any continuity errors. So if we were oh, to have awesome. from shot to shot different colors of the robots. For for us, like for for my shots, for example, right? Without going back to layout, I was able to jump in and through Blipprint quickly adjust the colors, make sure that story wise, in terms of continuity, all the cars are consistent, numbers are consistent. So there was a lot of really good quality of life features sort of packed into those blueprints that made us much faster. They also use the Niagara particle system for certain gun and explosion effects, and they also utilize some of the more flagship features like Nanite and Lumen to help with rendering. Now, one of the first questions I had when I watched the episode was, did they use metahumans? Metahumans are a really big aspect of Unreal Engine, and, you know, sometimes people go with you know, metahuman pipeline using DNA. Sometimes people just go with their own custom characters. What was kind of the, the pipeline for characters and rigging for this show? Metahuman, when we saw it coming, I was like, that's quite awesome. All our characters, almost all of the characters, are leveraging metahumans. Uh, so that you can get out of the box the rigging from there and the facial, anima the facial animator. Uh, and then came a metahuman animator to animate faces that also was a big game changer for us, a huge kind of time. As someone who has used metahumans a lot, this honestly is very encouraging, and they showed that there's not one way to approach metahumans. They were able to model and texture their characters completely from scratch, and then inject the metahuman DNA into those characters so that they had all of the functionality that we're used to. This then allowed them to use other features like metahuman animator so that they could bring in data from their facial motion capture rigs and apply that directly to their metahuman. The same thing applies to the body mocap, so this allowed them to have access to all of the fancy animation tools and control rigs while creating the episode. Now, if you're obsessed with lighting like I am, you might have been wondering if they used path tracing or lumen for the final render of the episode. In my research, I, I kind of came across that y'all used lumen as opposed to path tracing. And I think obviously that plays a very big part in the efficiency because as we all know, path tracing takes um, 10,000 times longer <laughs> than you know rendering with lumen. What was that process and like thought process like? You want everybody to see the same thing. Uh, and why would, uh, why would we use a farm and wait for hours for a frame or an hour even for a frame? I think it's all in the sense of pushing how much we can push Lumen to look like what uh, you, we are used to make. 
And I think this is a perfect testament to the power of Lumen, but it's also a testament to knowing that Lumen is just a tool, just like path tracing. And it's important to know the strengths and weaknesses of both. And this will help you as you're figuring out your animation pipeline for your project. Now, one of the biggest reasons that Blur decided to go with Lumen was just for its real time abilities and the sheer amount of time that they saved on rendering the episode. They were able to deliver hundreds of CG shots exponentially faster than if they were to use path tracing. And according to them, they would not have been able to meet their deadline if they used path tracing. That's why review process was kind of crazy for us. We could have like, I feel like 60 shots at once in review at any given review any day, especially towards the end. You just see the, pro the, the progress was insane. The, the whole show was coming together every day more and more. It wasn't like one or two shots. We just get packs like 50, 60 every day. We had, I think we had, were six or seven lighters on the show, but because it's a show that, that spread uh, uh, across a fair amount of time, at any time we were basically four at all times. So when you take four lighters, and I'm talking lighters, which means lighting, rendering, compositing, and scene assembly, uh, so each of those persons would do those four tasks, and you have to deal with almost 600 shots, <laughs> it's daunting, but clearly, it was possible. It was a fair amount of work, and we were very busy. But it's post suddenly it's possible to do this, uh, you know, because of how the engine works. And as you said, Vlad, we could, um, because of the run of time, which is almost nothing compared to what we are used to, well, suddenly you could turn around the whole sequence in a day. And for all of you computer hardware nerds out there wondering, the animators were equipped with RTX 3090 graphics cards for creating the shots. And then those same shots were rendered using a Quadro A6000 graphics card. And they told me the reason behind this was, you know, the RTX 3090 has 24 gigabytes of VRAM. The A6000 has 48 gigabytes of VRAM. So the big reason for this was that they knew that if they optimized the scene and it was able to run on a 3090, it should have no issues rendering on an A6000 because they then had double the VRAM. Because sometimes if your scene isn't well optimized and you go to render, it might max out the VRAM and it might crash Unreal. So this was kind of like a fail safe where they knew, okay, it's running smoothly and properly here on the 3090. We should have no problems and no crashes when rendering on the A6000. Now let's dive a little deeper into rendering and it's probably no surprise that they used Movie Render Queue for rendering out all of the shots. The thing is that we have 600 shots to render and I can't, we can't customize the render settings per shot. So we have to find at least a common set of render settings that work for the vast majority of them. And then if you encounter one specific, one um, specific problem, then we can tackle it and, and dive into it. Finding the right settings and being able to decompose in passes then gave us all we need, all we needed to, to get the quality we were trying to hit. But it was a journey. It took us a while. Uh, to figure that out. And, and it took us help from outside, from Epic, also to help us figure out. And if you're like me, you might be wondering what render settings did they use for a project like this? Well, I'm gonna share with you the screenshot that they shared with me for their render settings. You'll see the anti-alias settings and the console variable settings that they used for about 95% of the shots for the episode. Now they did do some variation in their anti-alias settings, which I thought was kind of interesting. If they had a shot that had a normal amount of movement, they set it to 24 samples. But if it was a shot with a lot of movement, they actually bumped it up to something like 48 samples. That way there were more iterations and you get a smoother transition in the movement. And so once they had all of their shots rendered out, they were all brought inside of Nuke where they added optics compensation like barrel distortion, chromatic aberration, lens flaring, halation, all of those things to really kind of add characteristics to the image that you would get from a real camera. And once all that post-processing is done, it's sent off to the editing team for sound design, color grade, and you have a final episode. So that is it for today, guys. I wanna give a huge shout out to JB and Vlad for their time. Those guys are amazing. And I am so grateful for them just sitting down and sharing their experiences with me. And I also wanna give a huge shout out to Blur Studios, Epic Games, and Amazon for allowing me to take a peek behind the curtain at how this episode was created. And as a reminder, I do have an upcoming course titled Unreal Engine Film School that dives into creating cinematics in Unreal Engine, but more importantly, focuses on implementing real world filmmaking techniques into your cinematics. Every 
everything from lighting techniques to camera techniques. It's all the things you need to take your cinematics to the next level. So if you want to sign up and be notified about pricing and release dates for the course, be sure to sign up for the wait list in the description below. And of course, if you haven't already, be sure to join our Discord channel. This is a place where you can come and surround yourself with other people in the virtual production community. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any future episodes. And as always, I'm David Stapp with Virtual Production Insider, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.